Well, today I'm joined by uh, Dr. Nisha, uh, who lives in America, and Mark, also known as Otomo from the Path of Zen. Uh, I'll put the link to uh, the, the channels of each participant here of Dr. Nisha and Otomo in the description so you can see their um, YouTube channel as well. Today we're meeting together, uh, we're talking about uh, the Buddha relics, uh, and Dr. Nisha has um, had quite an experience with the Buddha relics from a layperson point of view. And what's really interesting is I actually made contact with Dr. Nisha because there's not many people that talk about their experience with uh, Buddha relics. And there's not many people who are from a different, uh, I guess, chosen path or a different cultural background or et cetera, et cetera, that really isn't originally uh, Buddhist, like myself, like I'm originally not a Buddhist as well. So this always intrigues me, what brings people to Buddhism, what brings people to uh, experience Buddha teachings, things like this. So this is just a discussion about this. So I've invited Dr. Nisha uh, to talk about it. And I've also uh, invited Otomo from the Path of Zen um, to, uh, to, to talk about it as well, as well as being uh, a witness here uh, on the interview because it's not in a formal interview monks cannot really talk with lay females alone so Mark is also assisting with that as well. <laughs> Firstly Dr Nisha um, you know people can find out about your background and everything else so let's just get straight into it. Uh, the two questions I have for you. Uh, your original uh, I guess uh, religion or culture that you came from and what caused you to, uh, and the second question is, what caused you to want to go see the Buddha relics mm -hmm. and what was your experience? So three questions. Yes, it's great. And I'm so delighted to be with you, Bante and um, Mark in New York. It's late there, but um, anytime anyone asks me to talk about the relics, which is rare, um, this is one of the most rarefied in wonderful topics it's dear to my heart uh, I'm from Kenya I was born and raised in Africa I'm of the Hindu faith and I grew up in a very extended Indian family in Kenya so to give you an idea this is a big Hindu family our deities are Lord Rama Bhagavan Krishna Lord Hanuman okay and we're very spiritual people and so this has been a very core part of my life I came to America as a physician. I'm a doctor, and uh, I was at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Now, I've never heard about relics. I don't know what that was. So this was very unusual. And I got a phone call one evening from a friend in Edmonton, Canada. And she's a spiritual student, and we had met in Arizona. And Patricia called me and said, Nisha, the relics are coming to Minnesota, to Minneapolis. And I thought, okay, what, what is that? Now, this is the amazing part to me, okay? When I think back to that phone call, is that the word relic stirred something inside of me. I actually was very intrigued. So the word relic made me sit up. I took notice because you can dump information all the time, okay? We get lots of things told to us, go do this, go read that. But when she said relic, and they're in Minneapolis, they're from Buddha, go see them, that was it. So I didn't know what to make of it, but I gave meaning to it. I gave meaning to it. I didn't dump that information. I looked it up online. And this was amazing that the remains of Buddha were coming to Minneapolis. Now, here's the amazing thing. It was free. Okay, anybody could go, but I, I didn't believe it. So it was a tour stopping in Minneapolis and that you could go as many times as you wanted. And so I called the monastery. It was called Guto Monastery in Minneapolis. 
And the monks are in puja, they don't answer the phone. And I was thinking, you need a ticket. Surely there must be a line outside the door. So somebody finally answered. It was a sponsor of the tour. Her name is Nancy Dadak in Minneapolis. She has a gift store at Tibetan artifacts and so on. And she said, no, come, it's open. You can come from, you know, it was I think 10 a.m. till about 6 p.m. every day. And she says, you don't need a ticket, just come. So by Sunday, you know, it, it, usually the relic tours open on a Friday evening until Sunday. So um, I am a busy doctor, okay? I've, <laughs> I have lectures and all these things to do. And on a Sunday, I thought, I'm going to go and see these things. It, it's not, I told you something gets stirred in me. I had no idea what relics are. All I saw was the, what the internet showed me that there are these little objects like pearls. And so I went with like a curious mind, like a tourist almost, okay? Expecting absolutely nothing. I just went out of curiosity and this is what happened. So this is a little home, Northern Minneapolis, it's converted into a monastery called Guto. And I entered the door and there was a, a, a chant in Tibetan. It was uh, for honoring Buddha. I can't remember, it wasn't on Mani Padme Home, but it was a beautiful chant. And I was reading the poster as I was entering the door and right away I started to feel a change. Like something was, um, it was just beautiful. I, it, it's hard to describe. Then I saw the Maitreya statue. You go inside and on a table was this huge statue of Maitreya Buddha. And then there was these glass cases where the relics are kept in little stupas, okay? And I laid my eyes on Shakyamuni. And next to Shakyamuni, I'm getting goosebumps by the way, next to Shakyamuni is Rahula. Rahula was Shakyamuni's son. And next to Shakyamuni is Kasyapa. Kasyapa Buddha preceded the historical Buddha. So I'm watching these relics, looking at them. And as I move to the next case, which is the first Buddha council, Ananda, Shariputra, Madgalyana, Nagarjuna. Now I say these names because when I was a child in Kenya, my mother gave me books of Nagarjuna and Ananda. So these names were familiar, but I thought they were just really interesting and poetic. When I saw those relics in the second case, I was blown away. And, and I felt something like coming out of the case, like, It was the most exquisite feeling of love. I fell to my knees. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe that this was real, that this, these entities have walked on planet Earth, okay? So I think the monk was watching me because there were a few monks, they bless you on your crown chakra. And I had to be actually led away to sit down because I couldn't, I, I, I was too wobbly. And I think what was to be a five minute visit became, I think I was there till closing time. There was no sense of time. There was no sense of thought. My mind was quiet. I can honestly say there was a taste of this very rare kind of state of consciousness, okay? That, that you, it, it, th there's, no, um, there's no counterpart in ordinary experience, at least in my life, that I felt this, okay? And they actually had to tell me the, mon the monastery is now closing. <laughs> you, you need to go, are you okay? <laughs> so, um, it was, it was vast, it was intimate, it was love. Um, there was silence. Si the outer conditions were the same. 
nothing changed. The inner shifted, okay? And here's the really amazing thing. Now, as a doctor, you think, okay, first of all, how is these things even communicate through this plexiglass and reach out and give you a feeling like that? This is not an ordinary radiation, if you can call it radiation or energy. Energy is actually incorrect, but we use certain terms to get across something of that sublime feeling, okay? And I wrote a paper around it. I was so, I was so changed and so shifted forever. That one experience within a few seconds, right? It wasn't some, I just went there curious and then I left almost like what, what happened here? Because in my world, when you think about something conscious, it has to have a brain, it has to have eyes and ears and a nose and has to speak to you. This wasn't speaking anything. This was no body there. Yet the consciousness, the intention of Buddha was so tangible, okay? So I had to revise this whole thing about medical education, which was misplaced. There is no brain here. There is no brain here. And look at this. Buddha has passed away, left his body, what, 2,700 years ago? 2,566 to be exact, but who's counting? Who's counting? <laughs> it's beyond this realm. So these <laughs> objects have a hot life. If you look at scientific terms, they've never disappeared. If anything, they're multiplying. So this experience of silence, of timelessness, of uh, peacefulness, of a consciousness that exists now on our planet Earth now from 2,500 years ago is immense. That blows apart all medical education that I've had. And I was glad for that because suddenly it makes you open up a perception to a whole new level of nature. We're not separate from nature, Bantu. So this is a very high form of nature and you cannot brush it aside now. This is the time. And I remember when I left the monastery, first of all, I couldn't think, but when I could get my wits about me, <laughs> you know, I said, I'm gonna bring the Buddha masters to my home. I made an intention. And when you put an intention in a Buddha field like that, it's gonna manifest. It has to, it's a prayer, yeah. And, and so I told my family, they had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and I made, a, I made a proposal, actually it was my brother and myself to the Maitreya project in London. We heard nothing, but in three months, a letter came through an email that we've been granted permission to host the relics. The only time the relics ever came to a private residence because he went to monasteries, to uh, universities, to churches. Um, okay, so it came to my home and I could really see this wasn't a one-off experience. It wasn't just unique to me, it was universal. This is universal. And it also brings to mind something that one of my teachers has said to me. You cannot see it out there unless you see it in yourself. You cannot see it out there unless you see it in yourself. The Buddha light is within you. It responds. It will unify and shows you, huh, here's your home. I felt at home in that, in that time I was in Guto, okay? And I'll tell you, for a week afterwards, because I was in a, in a very different state, I was really not anchored. I'll be honest, it was 
wonderful and not wonderful because you lose interest in eating. All my senses were so accentuated that as a physician, I come to clinic the next day, I don't want the fluorescent lights on. <laughs> I didn't want the patients talking to me. I said to them, could you please whisper? And I had dark glasses on it. And my secretary said, you look different. Are you okay? And I said, I'm not okay. But here's the miracle. Here's the real miracle also. I worked in an academic center where on a Monday, you always see new patients. You have an incoming group. You work them up during, you know, you, you introduce them to the system on Monday. You work them through all those tests and Friday, you wrap up. Now on Monday, I thought, oh my goodness, I'm gonna see new people and they think I'm nuts. Cause I can't, I can't think, I, I have to literally, energize myself to understand what they're saying because the language was so coarse you're talking buddha language in this it, 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 there was a disconnect okay in my world for those days yeah. when i looked at my list Bantu, for monday every single one of my patients was somebody i knew my my i told my secretary hey don what happened here she says I don't know. I was so grateful because the patients I saw on that day, on that morning, one was a, a lady, she was in her 80s. She had osteoarthritis, I won't forget her because she said, Dr. Manik, you look different. Something shifted in you. And I explained to her and I brought up those pictures of the relic tour and she says, oh, you know, this has happened to me a few times in church. This was, you know, she says, you really need to, um, you need to take time, really process this. This was the kindest thing a patient could have told me. Okay. And then the next patient was a policeman. He understood it too. I said, look, look what happened to me. He says, you look different. I said, well, this is what I did yesterday. <laughs> and I can tell you, it's really hard to process language, to write things. I just want to go home and just be in meditation. And so my patients were very gracious and said, well, you're very, very fortunate. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there for a moment. I want you to ask me questions. Yeah, Mark, if you please. Oh, sure. Um, do you know of the concept of empowerment? Have you ever heard about it? Mm -hmm. I've heard about it. Can you explain so I understand how I... Sure. Um, I spent a little bit of time with the, uh, the Tibetans, um, mostly with the FPMT in the San Diego area. And this is after Mama Zopa had passed away. Um, however, they also um, held dearly to the idea or the concept of holy relics and that yeah. the teachers would also create a Buddha field and could empower things, could empower a chair, um, things they touched, a, a stupa, or even their remains would be what's called empowered. So that's what I mean by empowerment. And generally, the, 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 the teachings was that by being within proximity or in contact with the the um, the relic or the holy object that you, you would be empowered, you would experience or know that empowerment and can become in sympathy with it or become in resonance with it. Yes. Have you ever heard, have you ever heard of that? Yes. Um, and I call it not, not so much empowerment, but your consciousness at a very high level, if you're of uh, Christ consciousness or Buddha consciousness, absolutely, the things and objects you touch will be imprinted. I call it imprinting. And uh, you're calling it empowerment so that 
that um, object is now a vehicle. It's, it is a, like a device to show you the essence. You get the feeling of that essence and it's very helpful. It's very helpful. And you know, this uh, state that I'm describing is not for a mysterious few people. Lama Zopa brought it to the ordinary folks, which is really remarkable. And for, I think the tour was going on for 12 years, 11, 12 years. And I, I think millions of people came in touch with them. Um, so Lama Zopa actually passed away last week in Kopan in Nepal. So he entered clear light and uh, I think uh, now he's merged back into the Buddha field. That's the news I received, it was last week. And um, I sent it to Bantu that uh, there's something going on at FPMT. This is big news, obviously. So um, yes, I do understand what you're talking about. Oh, okay, maybe I think I might have misspoke about the Lama Zopa. I think it was this predecessor. Um, Lama Yeshe. Lama Yeshe, yes. <laughs> that, you know, so Lama Yeshe was the one that kind of set up the FBMT, and he was the yes. uh, the one that had the holy relics of him. And um, um, and very sad to hear of the passing of Lama Sopa. That's that's a great loss to the FBMT. Yeah, it is. Um, I've met him. I you know I always say have because you know the, these are mystics. They're timeless. They're not bound here in this space or time. These things don't have meaning. Um, but uh, in Kurukula Monastery in Boston. Um, his Holiness was giving a lecture uh, and the relics were there. And so I published the paper of the Buddha relics because I had a really important experience, not only personally, but to have them come home and really observe, observe firsthand what would happen to the space, to the people, what happens to the face, what happens to many, many testimonies and you could capture it. And I think uh, Bantu and I have discussed it, but how do we, because there's such a richness to this subject and we decided we'll do the science in a later uh, sort of session. Um, but uh, Lama Yeshe, you are right, was the, you might say inspiration, had the idea that we need to bring these objects out of the monasteries and take them to the people. Thank God. And then Lama Zopa continued that, uh, you know, vision. And they're <clears throat> currently building a Maitreya statue in Kutinagar to house the relics because they radiate this, this information of love. Okay, it's not contained now. It's now radiating out. And it has a the potential of that high consciousness raises the sea and all the ships rise. All of us are benefited. Yeah. Do well, you think that the uh, the relics might be Chermas? I'm sorry, say that again. Do you think that the relics together might be a Cherma? A Cherma? One, one of the hidden teachings that uh, was prophesied. I think, you know, during the relic tour, there are termas there. They are actually placed as part of the tour. I believe so. And, and I'm not a Buddhist, but here's what Lama Zopa has said repeatedly. The relics are also a way to enlightenment. Then there's the teaching. If you're purified enough and you don't get attached to them, I think you can really make, it speeds your, your way home. It speeds your way home, yes. So I think it's a hidden teaching. Let, let, me, let, me, let me get in there. What's really interesting is that the Buddha talks about this in the suttas where <clears throat> if you were to visit the four important places um, that one automatically goes to heaven after this life. There's a whole discourse on this. So, for example, if you go to the, uh, if you visit the place where the Buddha 
left where the Buddha was born, where the Buddha enlightened, and where the Buddha set the will of Dharma in motion, these four important places. And here in Thailand, there's tours like all the time, all year round going to, well, now they've restarted because COVID kind of stopped that for a while, but they've, you know, before and, and now after, uh, that's, that continues on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I've, I've been to India once and I went to the, um, the four places with a group of people and uh, without getting too much into it, uh, it was astonishing the difference before visiting and then after the tour mm -hmm. and, and, and the way everybody was behaving. And um, it, was, it was quite astonishing and it was quite interesting to me because like you, I have a, I, I, I I've got an applied science background and not being of the Buddhist culture and not mm -hmm. even being of the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian culture or Asian culture per se, I'm about as Western as you can get, right? Like uh, my parents are Italian. I was born in Australia. So it's about as West as you can get. Mm -hmm. um, so, so basically uh, all these things interest me and I'd like to explore them a bit more. But one thing that we can uh, we can we can definitely I think attest to is that what's really incredible is when you have a spiritual experience like this and you try to go back to your community, particularly in the Western world, um, and talk about it, it. It's it's kind of like this universal cast out system <laughs> where you, everybody thinks. <laughs> Things you've gone, you know, you you've gone. Uh, what's it called, Lulu? What it was called, like around around the bend. But this is it. Like I think what's important is that we in Western culture we we put a lot of attention on family and career and, and study, but we put very little attention on spiritual awakening or spiritual mm -hmm. awareness. Mm -hmm. You know, and that there are things that are beyond description. Uh, and science has a tough time with those. And, and I guess, like you said, we'll, we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, look, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're coming up to time soon. I think that was uh, a great discussion. Do, do you want to add some? Let, uh, I'll let you finish last, Dr. Nisha. Uh, Mark, do you want to add some last uh, comments before we wrap it up? Well, I just think that here in the West, we'd like to apply psychology and all kinds of medical terms to these um, spiritual realizations. And we kind of try to wash it away with scientific talk. And, and then sometimes we do a disservice to ourselves in that way. Mm. So just be careful about it. Well, it's interesting that, you know, uh, as I described that I come to clinic and I was worried and yet it was the patients, the ordinary person who said, wow, wow, you are so lucky, process it. I was trying to tell my colleagues, they didn't know what to do with me, but they came around, they did. Because yeah, I but didn't... isn't that interesting? Isn't yes. that interesting though? Like you would expect family and friends to go, wow. But instead what happens is, is usually, what happens to a lot of us, especially in the Western world, not all, but a lot of us, is usually the family and the close friends tend to um, tend to become distant when you have this. I, I was I was fortunate that way that you know I put the proposal to host the relics. My family thought, "What the heck are you doing?" Uh, but they accepted See? it. They <laughs> did. They, well, yeah, they were going. Oh, I don't know what is this. So what, what are you talking? About? What is a relic? And I said, listen, this is so immense. It's like Buddha is coming to your home. And uh, <laughs> um, for me, it, it was such a unity to, and it, it strengthened my Hinduism. There is no separation. There's no separation with Christ consciousness or Krishna consciousness. I've been fortunate to have had the opportunity to go to some of these now pilgrimage sites and also visit the the relics of christian saints so these things do as you said empowerment or imprinting they are there to assist us 
it's a tool. We have scripture, we have rosary, we have all of these things. We have this discussion. This discussion is one of the rarest. And I, 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 I'm going to be a bit biased. I think the Buddha relics, there's nothing like Buddha relics. I'm going to be a bit biased <laughs> there. Because, well, I, I say that, I, I say that not because, okay, like, I like to joke a bit, but uh, I've, I've been, being Italian, I went to a lot of churches and I went to a lot of places, but there was nothing like visiting the, um, yeah. the four places in, in, in India and millions. Of, and it's just funny because it's so consistent, this message that you're giving yeah. Yeah. so many people after visiting. I think it, it's also India as well, because India is the birthplace of a lot of things. And it's, you know, like it's a pretty incredible country in itself has a lot of incredible things there yeah. um so you know sometimes i wonder if it's uh you know a bit of that mixed in you know uh but definitely you yeah, you, def you went into like a, a empty cup you were not running over right the, your your cup is is ready you're receptive then buddha yeah. consciousness is going to come it meets you uh, there, there is no other way 